morning. We want to welcome everyone this morning. We've gathered in the house of the Lord. We are here to worship Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Join us this morning, would you please, as we worship our Lord, our God, and our King. Oh 
the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it.
this one. Surgeries this past week. 
Lord, we're thankful for doctors and for medicine, for hospitals, for their talents and for the gifts. But Lord, we realize that healing comes from your hand. And we praise you and we thank you and we give you glory this morning. Lord, we're thankful that we can celebrate the times of joy with you. We ask that you bless this young couple that was married here last night. We pray that their house would be filled with peace, that they would know your presence. And Lord, that same prayer goes for each and every family that is represented here this morning. We need you in our hearts. We need you in our homes. Lord, we pray for your strength as we take you to our places of employment, that we can be the living example of Jesus Christ in our community. Lord, we just ask that as we bring our needs and our concerns to you, that your Holy Spirit would come and that you would speak to our hearts. We pray to the Lord for those who are in leadership, leadership of our community, of our state, and of our nation. Lord, we desperately need you within our culture. We as a people turn to you, dear Lord, and we cry out to you, asking that you would intervene in a mighty and powerful way. Lord, there's so much heartache and hurt as we look around this world, but we realize that we can be the salt and the light that you've called us to be, Jesus Christ, to the world that we come in contact with. And so, Lord, we pray for your grace. We pray for your peace. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us on a daily basis. Lord, we want to come and to say thank you. Thank you for who you are what you have done for us. Lord, as we worship you this morning, may we worship you in spirit and in truth as we honor you as our one true living God. And Lord, we pray this and we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our risen Savior. And we sing together as a church and as a congregation.
might be this you may be dismissed to children's church. Let's turn this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Today's message is entitled Double Trouble. A couple of things that hinder our walk with the Lord that prevents us from being the disciples that He has called us to be. Gospel, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 12. It was October of 1982 and in the fall of the year our country and our culture enjoys a sport football. We enjoy a good game of football. Well there was a team in Wisconsin and part of the Big Ten. They're very proud and they were hosting Michigan State. Unfortunately that year Wisconsin wasn't the best and Michigan State was actually having a pretty good year that year. And they meet in the afternoon and there's just tens of thousands of people and then you have the football game being played. Unfortunately for Wisconsin, even though they were hosting the game, it was really one-sided. I mean, it was bad. And it was bad by the halftime. And the game kept playing and they kept playing and they, they couldn't stop the game. You know how it goes. You know, the clock has to tick. And the game kept getting worse and worse. Now, normally in a situation like this, the home crowd would be very quiet. It, you know, there's not much to cheer. There's not much going on there. But throughout the course of the game, the Wisconsin fans kept getting louder and louder. And somewhere right around the middle of the fourth quarter, this huge eruption starts going throughout the entire crowd, throughout the entire audience, and they were cheering, and people were standing, and, and they were, oh, everyone was so excited, even though their team was literally getting slaughtered on the field. And the announcers didn't understand, they, they, they couldn't comprehend what was going on, but what they didn't realize was that at that exact moment, 70 miles away, the Milwaukee Brewers were playing in the World Series. And they had just won game four. <laughs> and it is now tied. The World Series was tied two to two. And what the announcers didn't understand, what a lot of people didn't comprehend, is that there was an unseen game happening 70 miles away and that everyone was listening to their little transistor radios. And they weren't cheering for the game that was going on right there. No, no, they were cheering for a game someplace else. And so often in life, as Christians, we're not cheering on our circumstances of life that we see right in front of us because there's something else. There's heaven. There is a place where God rules and where God reigns, where the streets are made of gold. There is no sickness. There is no illness. Right? There is the presence of God. And so sometimes, as Christians, we're happy and we have this sense of joy and we have this sense of peace that has nothing to do with our circumstances because we have faith in the Almighty. Amen. See, we're part of a spiritual world and there's a game that's going on that nobody can see but that we know it within the heart and within our life, within the very depths of our soul and that Jesus has already won the game. And he's paid the price. And so we live in this relationship with God. We live with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that sometimes other people can't see. And so we make decisions and we make choices for this life that the world will look at and they will question and they will wonder and they, and they ask you questions all the time. Like, why are you making that decision? Why are you making that choice? Because we know at the bottom of our heart that's where God's will leads us. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to stand on faith on what God directs us and tells us. 
So let's read scripture together from the book of Hebrews. And we'll begin reading in verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile me. That no bitter root grows up. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come into your presence. We ask the Lord that you would help me as I preach this morning, that these would be your words, that you would lead and that you would guide. And this we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. My very first house that I owned was in Texas, and it was a little bit of an older home. And you learn a lot when you own a house and when you're responsible for taking care of a house. And I learned very quickly that I am not mechanically inclined. <laughs> and it's a very painful lesson to learn. Now, I grew up in a house where my dad was a mechanical genius. He could fix anything. I, it was just, it's amazing. He could, he could tear it apart. He could look at it. And he could put it back together and it would work. Now, I got the first part of that time. I could take things apart. I, I can destroy things. I can break things. It's the putting back together. That seems to be a stretch for me. And it's very disheartening. And not only is it disheartening, it's very expensive. Because then you can't just fix something. You know, the extent of my fixing stuff is like, you just bang it on the side, right? TV's not working, you bang it. Computer's not working, you bang it. Yeah, that's just, I don't know what, I know. But every once in a while, Stuff in a house breaks. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Things break. So in our house, we had, this, we had this little bathroom. And in the bathroom, there was a shower. And the shower started to drip. And it, it dripped. And it, you know, sometimes at night, stress and worry, life and the job and all that stuff, you'd wake up in the night and you'd look at the ceiling and there'd be no sound except the dripping. And you hear the dripping. You hear the dripping. And what was I thinking? That's costing me money. That water's dripping and those city you know, they're churning. It's, it's costing me money. I've got to fix this. So I then start an adventure on fixing my shower. So for the first month or two, I just turned the handle really hard. <laughs> Because somewhere in the depths of this shower, between the handle and the water pipe, there's this little washer. It's, it's, it's made of rubber. And if you can really get in there and just tighten that thing, then the water would stop. Except after a while, that doesn't work anymore. Because actually by putting more pressure on it, I'm tearing the washer. So eventually, that doesn't work anymore. You, just, you, get, you got to open it up. So you took off the handle, and there's a hot and there's a, a cold side, and then I take stuff apart, right? Because I'm good at taking stuff apart. And then very, very deep inside, there is a washer, and there's a little round circle seat. It's where the round pipe meets the flat washer. And that's where the water leak always happens, where the round meets the flat. And so you can go to the store and they'll sell you a little box about the size of your thumb. And it's got all types of washers in it, all types of sizes. It's really exciting. And then you get to figure out which one fits and figure out which one doesn't. And it's trial and error. I mean, it really is. And so I eventually had to replace the seat because it had worn out. And so you have these little cracks and you have these little crevices, you have these little divots. And you had to do both. You had to do the hot and the cold, both sides. And they've got all types of special tools that you can buy for this. Oh yes, there's a special wrench. It looks like an L. 
and you use it, and, and that's the only thing you can use it for. But praise the Lord, I can go buy a tool. And I can put it in my garage, never to be used again. But I now have it. So you have the hot and the cold. And there are two things I want to talk about this morning. It's almost like a cancer that destroys our walk with the Lord, that destroys our faith, that destroys our heart, that hardens our soul. These two things are like a cancer. Now, I look at our culture today. I look at friends and family members. I, I look at the church and I see cancer that impacts so many families. And what is cancer? It, it's a, a tumor or it's cells that grow rapidly that take away from our health. And, and it hurts us. It destroys organs. Eventually it can cause death. But it's something that is growing, something that is, that is within us. That it, it, It's a twist. It, it, it's a turn. It's cancer. And there's lots of ways that we can treat it. But we have to get to the source because there's all these other symptoms that happen. And so as I look at this passage this morning from Hebrews chapter 12, I see that there is an enemy of our soul and that we are called to live in peace. Live in peace with one another. And the two things I want to discuss this morning is anger and bitterness. Anger and bitterness. To me, that's the hot and the cold. That's, that's double trouble. Anger, to me, is this, is this emotion. It's almost, uh, it gets you hot and, and it just, it, you're angry and, and you're so upset and so passionate and so mad about a situation that literally you see red. You're so angry. And it, it impacts how you view the world. It impacts how you interact with others around you. And sometimes this emotion it just builds up within you. And there's just one little thing. And all of a sudden, you get upset and you start yelling at somebody. Or you act out. Or you lash out. It's almost like a volcano of emotion. Everything that's been building up. And so you're not really upset about the chair or or the TV controller, or, or you know the remote control, who has it, whatever. But for some reason, that's just a trigger, and all of a sudden, you just, boom, you blow up. And, and people wonder, oh, I didn't think the chair was that big of a deal. And really, it's a remote control. Why, why are they upset and stomping and throwing a fit? Well, it's not just about that, right? There's this unseen thing going on within your life that's building up pressure. And the scripture here says that we must endeavor, which means we have to work at it. We, ha we have to pursue it to live in peace with one another. And there are times where that can be extremely difficult to live in peace. Because we're upset. It, it, just, it just gets to us at, at our core on who we are. So anger in and of itself is not a sin. I mean, we're human. We, we have these emotions. So we get angry. That is not a sin. We look in Scripture and we see in the Gospels where it says Jesus was angry when he saw what the community had done to his father's house. They, heard, they had turned this place of worship. They had turned the Lord's temple into a place where they could make money by ripping people off. You know, people were traveling for days and weeks and they couldn't bring sacrifices with them. It's just too far to travel. So we would get to the temple and then we'd have to buy, uh, buy uh, either a little dove or, or maybe a, a lamb or something like that that we could then use with our family in the sacrifice. And so they would say things like, well, we can't use your Gentile money because it has graven images of people on it. And, and the Lord says, let's not make any graven images. So you can only use temple money to buy things in the temple. So you give me $100 of your money and I'll give you $50 of the temple money. See, and that's how they were ripping people off. You go back home, how much is a lamb? Well, I don't know. Let's say it was $100. You come to the temple, how much is a lamb? $100. <laughs> but it takes you 200 
to buy the temple money in order to get that land. And Jesus looked at this. Uh, money changers and, and people are there. They were just there to collect money from the people. They had completely missed. The purpose of the temple is to say, this is the presence of God and you're coming to the Lord and you're going to worship Him and you're going to depend upon life because you're trusting in God. You're putting your faith in God. And for the people to take advantage of individuals, it stirred up within Jesus, well, His anger. Because people were using the framework of his fall to take advantage of others. See, anger in and of itself is not a sin. But it's how we handle it. Or do we handle it? How it handles us. Because then all of a sudden we begin to lash out and we begin to do things and we begin to say things and maybe we hurt somebody who's near and dear to us and sometimes when words are said, they can never be taken back. And we end up doing things that have consequences that are far beyond the cause. And it's just, it just makes us mad. We don't have any control whatsoever. There's a couple of more verses in this passage. If we'll turn to verse 16 and 17. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You see, Esau, in his anger and in his, well, his hunger, had sold his birthright to his brother. But when he was older and he wanted that birthright, well, he didn't have it. He had already sold it. And even though he cried about it, he still couldn't get that blessing, even though he was upset about it. So often people in our world think and feel that if they're sorry about something, there should be no consequences whatsoever. I don't understand. I said, I'm sorry. Why are you still upset at me? Well, because of what you said. Because of what you did. There are consequences to our actions. And when anger takes over, we lose control. And not only that, it interrupts our relationship with the Father. It hurts our relationships on earth. It hurts our relationship with the Almighty uncontrollable anger. And also there's the anger that many describe as passive aggressive. This is the sneaky anger. This is the things done where, where you know, in and of itself it's no big deal, but it's the attitude. It's the little actions. It's the attitude that we have and it changes our relationship with those around us. So what do we do? What do we do in the face of anger and heated emotions? Well, you can go to any library, you can go to any bookstore, you can go to the shelf that says self-help, right? And you can pull off pretty much any book and they're going to say something on the order of recognize, remove, and resolve. Right? You know, recognize you're angry, take a step back, uh, seek to solve the problem, resolve the issue at hand. Really? I mean, really? Because I know when I'm angry, I know when I'm upset, and it doesn't take a genius to find out you're mad. You, you know that. And let me tell you, other people know that as well. They can tell. There's just something about the, the body language. There's just something about the face. There's just something about your words, your tone. People know you're mad. And, and I will agree, there are some times we're taking a step back, taking a breather, going outside, might actually be the very best thing you can do. If, if you're about to say something that's going to hurt somebody else, before you do that, let's think about it. Let's just stop. Let's just, you know. The other day I was involved in a meeting. Things were getting heated. Things were being said. And so one individual got up and said, I think I had a phone call. <laughs> and he steps out of the room. 
everybody looks around. Did you hear his phone ring? Did you hear it? Oh, I didn't hear his phone ring. But for whatever reason, that broke the tension. And everybody went, you know, maybe when he comes back in, we need to uh, find a different approach. Which did. It was resolved. But when we look at Scripture, what do we actually do? How, how do we do these things? Biblically, I believe we can look at passages that say that we are to cry out to God. That when we're mad, that when we're angry, when we take those few moments, when we take a step back, and there's something that's building up pressure, when this volcano is starting to bubble over, we need to cry out to God. Because you know what? He is a great, big, wonderful God, and He has big shoulders, and He can handle it. And our disappointment, and our anger, and all those things that affect us, we can tell God about it. And maybe, I don't know, everyone's different. Everybody has their own system. Go into your little, your, the room, that, you know, your little area, and discuss it with the Lord. Some people like to get in their car and drive and just let it all go. Just talk about it. Yell at it. Scream a little bit because nobody else is around. You're driving in your car. You might look funny to the other drivers when they see you doing this, you know, banging on the steering wheel. But sometimes you just need to let the Lord know about it. Because there are times when we are angry over how other people have reacted to us, and sometimes we're anger, angry over what other people have done to us. And in my life, what I have experienced more than anything else is that people can often say a lot of stuff to me, water off a duck's back. But when you start talking about family and children, that's a whole different world. And that's when we really know that we need to go to the Lord and ask for His wisdom. And maybe taking a step back is the appropriate thing. And we need to really ask ourselves, why? Why is this really a big button? Have you ever known anybody who loves to push buttons? I mean, they just like to come into a room, find out where you're sitting, and go, beep, beep. Just push your button. And they just love to do it. And then they smile, and they stand up, and they walk away. And you're like, why in the world did they just do that? Well, things are boring that day. We need a little drama. Go in there and stir the water. Oh, another favorite one is when they come and they make this big announcement and then they leave the room. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go throw a grenade in the middle of this discussion and then I'm out of here. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you make that sort of declaration, let's talk about it. You know, some people, when they go to the Lord, they like to write it out, to journal, to write a letter, just so that they can express what they're feeling. So biblically, how do we handle anger? We resolve it and we go to the Lord and we don't let anger fester. Resolve it. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it. Work with it. And before you leave, make sure you have direction from the Lord and it's just not your opinion. Before you leave a job, before you leave a church, before you leave a relationship, before you leave, make sure that's God's direction. Because if you leave without resolving the issue, it's going to follow. And no matter where you go, that's going to be a trigger point. You see, anger acts like a cancer and it destroys our relationship with others and with God. But the other one, the, the cold, to me, that's bitterness. Bitterness is aged anger. It's anger that has been dealt with. It's anger that's stirred. It's anger that's stewed. It's anger that's sit there for a while. And this is normally revealed in a hard heart. That's bitterness. We stop caring. I remember in college we were having a discussion. I think it's probably a class someplace. And people want to know what the opposite of love was. 
And so several people said, well, I know what the opposite of love is. It's hate. You know, opposite of love and hate. And I disagreed with them. I said, no, I don't think that is the opposite of love. I think apathy is the opposite of love. Because hate and love are, well, you know, kind of close. Pretty close. But apathy? Just don't care. I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. We just move on. I mean, there's no recognition. There's no, there's no value that we see there. There's no interaction with other people. We're just going on within our life. Apathetic to all the things that the Lord is doing in our world and through other people's hearts and lives. We just don't see it. And what's worse, a lot of people just don't care. Why? Because of a hard heart. It's this bitterness. It's another cancer that eats away. And a symptom of bitterness is this loss of compassion. It's, it's this lack of caring. We just, we just don't see the love of Jesus lived out in our life and in our spiritual walk with Him. We're just here to do the business of the Lord and to move on. Don't really need to interact with other people. Don't really need to talk to other people. Just let me do my thing and let me get on. And we give people the cold shoulder. And ultimately what bitterness does to us is it stops us seeking the presence of God. We just stop asking. We just don't go there anymore. We just don't even bother. We don't read our Bible. We only pray when other people remind us to do it. And we really don't seek the fellowship of the church. Why? Because we're better. And we've lost the sense of care. It just doesn't matter anymore. One of the churches that I pastored it had a beautiful kitchen. Just an absolutely gorgeous kitchen. And because it had an absolutely gorgeous chicken, uh, chicken, <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> hey, I'm a Nazarene, right? It's, it's, a good chicken means it wasn't from a good chicken. I'm going to stop. All right. Here we go. We had fellowships. Let me put it that way. And all the ladies would go into this area where they cooked. <laughs> Usually with the sink and the oven, and all the ladies would get in there, and they would, you know, do what ladies in church do. And it's a wonderful thing. So there are two ladies in the particular congregation that I pastored at the time. That I mean, they smile at one another, they nod their head, but when one was in the kitchen, the other one wouldn't go in. And you could actually see when this one walked in, the other one would walk out the other door. They can never be in that room together. Now, it took a while for me to recognize this, but one day, I believe through the presence of the Lord and the leading of the Holy Spirit, hey, watch this. And I watched it happen. And so I approached them. I said, I see this as a situation within our church. Is there something that I can do as a pastor? Is there something that I can, can help you with? Because... I see this bitterness there that you can't even be in the kitchen at the same time. And they both told the exact same story. Because one used to be married to a relative of the other. Good, close, personal friends, church, all of that, until the divorce happened. And ever since the divorce, they couldn't be in the room at the same time because there's so much anger over that broken relationship. And so I asked him, is there something that I can do to pray for you about? It? Is, there, is there something that we can do to help resolve this? And both of them agreed that it needed to be resolved, but that it was going to take more than just a single prayer from a young pastor who didn't know very much. You see, that's what bitterness does to us. It breaks relationships. It says, I'm not even going to go there 
anymore. So what do we do with bitterness? How do we handle this within our life? Because we definitely don't want our hearts to grow hard. We want our hearts to be open. We want the Lord to move within our life. Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge the fact that we have scars and pain from the past. We have a life that is lived in a fallen and broken world. And there is going to be misunderstanding, there's going to be hurt, and there's going to be pain in this life. And that there are times when we have scars from that. But when we find ourselves in a situation, we need to be in constant prayer with the Lord when it comes to an individual. How do you know that you have bitterness in your life? Well, when somebody comes into the room and you feel a change in your heart and spirit, then I'm going to suggest to you that is the very moment in time we need to seek the presence of God. Right then and right there. And we need to look at the list of all those things that we have asked God to forgive us for. This person did this to me. This person said this about me. This person did this. How can I ever forgive them? We ask the Lord to help us and to direct us. And we pray for God's tenderness to return to our heart. That's what we need more than anything else. The presence of the Holy Spirit to tend to our heart. So we can have the presence and the peace and the love of God that just melts it all away. And it's not just a one-time prayer either. It's this constant walk with God. Constant journey. And if something comes up that really seems to, to change our whole being, well, oh, what an opportunity to seek the Lord. Because it's a double trouble. It's a one-two punch. It will knock you down. Anger and bitterness. So we're concerned about the circumstances of life. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about the circumstances of life because that's where we're living. This is a world that we're living in. We are concerned about the circumstances of life, but we are not controlled by the circumstances of life. And there is a world of difference there. So when people lash out, you may not see what it's really all about. You may, there, there may be something else going on within their life, and you just happen to be standing there when it all comes out. We have to be willing to give them some grace and some forgiveness and be willing to say, it's not about just what I see. There's something else going on. And there are times when choices are made not by sight, but by faith. And so we're going to make the choice today that I'm going to live in the presence of God. I'm going to open my heart to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if there's any anger or if there's any bitterness, today is the day to resolve those issues. And that I'm not going to let the circumstances of life dictate my relationship to the Almighty because there's an eternity that we have to look for. See, there's something special that God has in store for us. It's His love. It's His presence. It's His peace. And don't let the circumstances of this life keep you from that. Ah, oh, we need the presence of God to melt our heart so that we can resolve anger quickly and we can soften our heart. Because we don't know all the things that went into that decision. And so the question this morning that we have to answer and that you have to think about is when your faith comes in contact with life's hardships, what will be your answer? When that round pipe meets that flat washer, what is going to be our answer? Is it going to be anger and bitterness or is it going to be love and forgiveness? That's the question with double trouble. This morning. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to close in a quick word of prayer.
If the Lord has been speaking to you through this message, I would encourage you to be responsive to Him this morning. If you'd like to come to the altar, there are definitely all. There are two things that will ruin our relationship with the Almighty. Anger and bitterness. It will destroy your relationships at home. It will destroy your relationships at work. It will destroy your relationships with the church. Please, please, don't let this day go by without seeking the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to come, I'd encourage you to do so. We'll wait just a moment for we'll close in a word of prayer this morning. I we'll encourage everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. If the Lord has been speaking to you through this message, if you would want to raise your hand, I'll be praying for you during this time. Okay, thank you, thank you. I see those hands, yes. Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we're able to worship you. For you are the Almighty. You are the great King. Lord, you are the creator of all that we see. And Lord, we are so thankful this morning that as we've gathered here, as we've joined the voices of the church around the world to praise the name of Jesus, we are so thankful that the Almighty God is concerned about the issues of our heart and our life, that you know the details of our circumstances. Lord, you know the source and the cause. In fact, Lord, we realize and we acknowledge this morning that you know it more than we do. Because often there are times that affect our lives that we are not even aware of. We don't even understand why we are reacting to that individual in this way. And so, Lord, we just pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the moving of your hands, that you would bring us to the point where we open our hearts to you, that we can find resolution to our anger, that we can soften our heart from the bitterness of life. Oh, Lord, we pray for our families. We pray for the marriages of our congregation. We pray for our children. We pray for those, dear Lord, who are about to start school again, those who are moving off into college. Lord, we pray for your hedge protection. We pray for your peace and we pray for your blessing. Lord, more than anything else, may your love flow into our hearts. May it overflow that we can bless others. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Help us, we pray this week. May your Holy Spirit guide us by your hand. And this we ask in the mighty and the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May He keep you. May He shine upon you this week.